Great, introduction to Modbus. So again, my favorite slide to try and describe what we're speaking about today. Uh, this triangle shows the various data communication systems that can be identified on a site. Um, our topic today, we're gonna to be talking about Modbus. Modbus runs over multiple different um, mediums and standards, anything from uh, serial based mediums such as RS-232, 485 and 422 to even um, industrial Ethernet uh, systems. You can put Modbus in industrial Ethernet systems. Uh, Modbus is typically used on the low level um, session between control systems and field devices. Uh, but what I have noticed in recent years is Modbus has kind of become the communication standard um, for field level integration uh, directly to IoT type solutions and cloud type solutions. So um, what a lot of these applications are doing and uh, IDX has, um, we call it IDX Next as the remote monitoring uh, solution, can take Modbus data directly from field level sensors and devices and even control sensors and interface that information directly to uh, cloud IoT type solutions uh, so that you can read data directly from the field or you can interface to the field, start a motor um, or uh, stop a certain process or just monitor the CO2 levels in a room to make sure that it's it's non-hazardous. Um, so yeah, I mean, I even I even have Bodbus in my, my home where I'm monitoring the power uh, that my home is using, using a small little IoT type solution with a Modbus enabled power meter. So Modbus is generally everywhere. And um, what I'm gonna do today is take you through all the uh, different, um, what I would call useful information to know about Modbus. Now Modbus is a very well covered um, protocol and it's very easy to get information um, on the web for any, um, for, for what, what is Modbus and how does Modbus interact and how, what is the standard to there being a lot of um, what we call SDKs or a, a, a software development um, basis that developers can implement into their products to make their products Modbus enabled. So open source protocol and very uh, easy to implement with uh, and that's why a lot of vendors do support Modbus um, and you get a lot of products in market that, that can talk Modbus. So let's uh, start off with uh, what is Modbus um, and then throughout the course of this lecture I'm going to cover digital systems, the operating principles of digital systems. Um, I'll dive uh, briefly into the Modbus protocol specifically, uh, into the bits and bytes of it. I'll talk about the physical transmission mediums that uh, or medias that uh, Modbus is transmitted on from serial to ethernet based systems. Um, I'll highlight a couple of useful network components uh, that you can use in your Modbus systems. And then I'll discuss what are the further steps after this lecture and what uh, additional training uh, is, is there available. So over here I've highlighted a typical um, Modbus network. There's actually an integration over here between Modbus TCP, which is a Ethernet based version of the protocol, um, as well as Modbus RTU, which is the serial based uh, version of the protocol. So what we can see over here, we have uh, what we call Modbus clients. These are the masters of the Modbus network. They ultimately control communication. That's uh, the device that will read information from your low level field sensors, whether it's a BSD or some simple IO, um, a way scale uh, for a truck. Yeah. Um, and to step back a little bit, what, what is Modbus? So Modbus is an application layer messaging protocol. It's a protocol that is very simple and it's designed to fetch information from remote devices and transfer information to remote devices. Uh, it provides a client server uh, communication between devices, so request response type um, uh, protocol. So how the request reply works, uh, a Modbus client will initiate the communication. He'll send a read or write request to any useful device on the network, uh, whether that's an IO block. That device will receive that request and if he can, will respond with the information. Within Modbus TCP, you can have multiple masters that can interface with a single slave module. So if this Modbus client integrated into this PC is interested in a bit of information and this PLC is interested in information, they can ask the device directly. Uh, Modbus RTU is a little bit different. In Modbus RTU, we can only ever have one master on the entire network. Um, that's that's pretty important. So you can only have a single master connected in your network. 
And there's uh, two Modbus um, RTU, well, main Modbus RTU standards. The first, which I've highlighted over here, RS232. Uh, recommended standard 232 is point to point, which means you only have two devices on the network, your Modbus master um, and your useful Modbus device, which is feeding obviously the weight of this truck. This device that I'm uh, portraying here as a Modbus RTU master is actually a gateway. Uh, he acts as a Modbus RTU master on the serial side, but he also acts as a Modbus TCP slave device to feed information to Modbus TCP devices. Um, and he can do both RS-232 and 485. So as we said, 232 is point to point. You can only have two devices. 485, you can have a whole host more of uh, devices where they simply daisy chain together and they share the same quantum medium to connect devices directly to each other. Where is Modbus used? So there's lots of different applications for where Modbus might be used, anything from building automation to industrial environments to IoT type solutions, um, as I'd mentioned, uh, to micro automation systems such as micro breweries, um, uh, or even just to uh, entertain automation engineers in their own homes uh, to measure temperatures and and power meters and uh, automate a few things. Uh, in this slide, I have uh, examples of a couple of common Modbus devices you might find, and there's tens of thousands of devices available. Uh, so maybe an HMI or micro uh, screen that allows you to interface with a certain process, such as our micro brewery application, small VSDs or drives, uh, small devices that are able to uh, power a motor, you get various different types of IO instruments and sensors. Uh, this device over here allows you to interface uh, analog uh, and digital uh, sensors and uh, devices in the field. And it talks Modbus, but it can also read and um, push in and out uh, analog and digital inputs and outputs. You get uh, Modbus controllers. Uh, Schneider Electric is, uh, uses uh, Modbus quite readily, both Modbus TCP um, and RTU, a lot of their control systems. Micro PLCs such as the Revolution Pi um, that allow you to automate um, small processes. Uh, again, favorite example, micro brewery type applications. Um, and even text displays uh, to give some warning signals or even to feedback performance on a site can be a Modbus device. So in order to understand Modbus, it's probably pretty important that we have an idea of why do we have Modbus? So Modbus is a digital system. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of clarity of what is a digital system? What are the advantages of it? And how does it differ from what, what else is out there? So a, a digital system is uh, or an automation system can be implemented as the sum of numerous parts working together. So in order to create an automation system, I need to have four main parts. Um, so the first I need to have is inputs into this automation system. Uh, input can be anything from temperature sensors to various different analog signals to even buttons which provide uh, as, a, as a digital input um, install automation system to start a certain process. Then I need to have uh, some sort of intelligence, something that, that those inputs are made useful. So this intelligence system would normally come in the form of some sort of Modbus controller. He reads the inputs, uh, makes a decision on the inputs and then writes outputs. An output can be anything from starting and stopping a motor to signaling a light, um, anything that is useful for creating my automation process. Now, in order to link all these inputs, uh, intelligence systems or controllers and outputs, I need to have some sort of communication system. And one of these communication systems um, would be Modbus. And we spoke on Tuesday about industrial ethernet. That's another form of communication system that can have lots of different protocols running on it from Profinet to Ethernet, IP to Ethercat, and to Modbus TCP. And then we spoke about Profibus last week. That's a field bus based system, also another communication system standard. So Modbus allows us to feed inputs into a intelligence system and feed outputs out to sensors in the field. These digital systems do have some risks behind them and some things we need to watch out for. Um, Two of, the, uh, or two, two of the risks that affect all of these digital communication systems and even affect uh, analog and hardwired systems would be uh, electrostatic and electromagnetic interference. Electrostatic interference is uh, generated by 
um, high voltage cabling running close and parallel to your uh, Modbus cable, your industrial communication cable. Um, and this can cause uh, noise to be injected on your digital signal, which can cause a failure in communications. Easiest way to prevent electrostatic information is to increase the distance between your Modbus cable and whatever the source of interference is, if it's high voltage cabling. High voltage cabling, anything above uh, 60 volts DC and AC should be separated um, anywhere between 10 to 50 centimeters from your Modbus cable. The second main form of interference, which we see in an industrial environments, would be electromagnetic interference. It's caused by noisy devices such as VSDs and motors that create a magnetic field. Um, again, easiest way to prevent electromagnetic interference is move your cabling away from the source of magnetic interference. Uh, the standards which we utilize in these uh, fields from Ethernet, industrial Ethernet based standards to uh, recommended standard 232485. They have a couple of implemented technologies to protect against these two sources of interference. Uh, the one is shielding the cable. So when you're implementing Modbus, whether it's Ethernet based or serial based, it's very important to ensure that you're using shielded cable and that uh, shielding or screen needs to be grounded at multiple points. Uh, the grounding allows any noise, which whether it's electrostatic or electromagnetic interference, to be drained to a functional grounding point and not to interfere with the digital communication that's running on that network. Other methods of protecting the system would be the twisted core um, cabling, which you would typically use in these systems, uh, and that helps to prevent electromagnetic interference causing current to flow in the cores of your digital communication system. Let's talk about some of the operating systems behind uh, digital systems. and. What is pretty important now is to understand what, what, what is the other side of uh, communication that I can get. So um, talking about digital versus analog, on the left here I have an analog signal and on the right here I have a digital signal such as uh, Modbus communication. Now my favorite example to use for analog signal would be a temperature sensor. So you could have a temperature sensor connected uh, onto a boiler and uh, he could be monitoring the temperature of the boiler and based on that my intelligence system can decide uh, do I need to decrease or increase the power going to that boiler to make it hotter or to reduce the heat and whatsoever it might be. So this temperature probe would feed a 4 to 20 milliamps signal um, and between 4 milliamps, which would be a, a very low temperature and 20 milliamps being the highest possible temperature that that um, temperature probe can measure, he would feed that information back to my controller. So. In this example, I'm looking at my analog signal, which is infinitely accurate, actually, um, and he can feed the temperature. So here I might be reading 108 degrees Celsius, and down here I might be reading 70 degrees Celsius, which is corresponding maybe between a certain milliamp or current or voltage analog input to represent that value. Now, the challenge which I have with the signal is, um, apart from you having to run a huge amount of cabling to each of these sensors out in the field, is that the cabling going to the sensor can suffer from various different forms of interference. That interference could be electrostatic or magnetic interference. It could be line attenuation, so um, the effect of the resistance of, of the cable running to that sensor. Um, it could be faulty interfaces or um, wh whatever might occur in the field. And now where I have this noise, or this black line is the noise and interference injected on the signal, where I'm expecting to read 108 degrees Celsius, what I'm actually reading is 120, which means that my intelligence system is gonna make, well, the, the, the logic which is integrated into them would be based off flawed information feeding into them. So the process would not be as accurate as it should be. Now, what I could do is instead of running this analog signal all the way from the temperature probe on my boiler to my control system, my intelligence system, is I, I could convert it to a digital signal and transfer that digital signal, the run of my plant rather. Now, what a digital signal does is it takes this uh, analog signal, it, it converts it to a digital signal. So in this case, it's still 108 degrees Celsius, but he's converting it to a binary string of ones and zeros. So if I just uh, pop up quickly my trusty programming calculator, 108 degrees Celsius. This would be my binary representation of that 108 degrees Celsius. Zero is being a false uh, value and one's being a true um, 
uh, Boolean value. So I send this binary string of zeros and ones through between the temperature sensor and the controller, and this value would be then interpreted by the controller and I would have an accurate 108 degrees Celsius. Now, digital cables are by far not immune to the noise that analog uh, cables are, are experiencing, but the difference is both these signals are experiencing the same interference and I can still see that that's a one, I can still see that that's a zero, so therefore my value is accurate. And apart from that, the in digital systems is also integrated uh, check mechanisms integrated into the protocol that allows you to check whether these ones and zeros have actually been received intact. And on top of that, remote configuration diagnostics are additional useful features of these systems. Now, within a digital system such as Modbus, we share the same cable for multiple different devices. So in this example, I'm sending my binary string or my serial data from device one, which could be my controller, uh, to device two. Device two will receive it and use the same cable to transfer the data back. So digital systems can send multiple values or pieces of information on the same cable. Um, when data is sent, it follows a request response uh, type mechanism within Modbus. So you'd have a controller send out a request um, or writing information to a device. The device would then respond. This can often be a bit of a, a challenge in uh, Modbus type systems where a device might take quite a while to respond. And what experience has taught me is that uh, there's a timing setting that's set within the Modbus controller that's called timeout. And what timeout means is that if I send a request to a device, I start a clock. And if that clock expires, which is my timeout clock, then uh, I know that, that communication has failed to that device. And very often system integrators would set that timer to quite a high value to try and compensate for uh, poor data communication. So uh, things that might delay the signal coming back. So they might send it to five seconds or 10 seconds. Now this can make your cycle times of the system for all the devices connected within that system very long because I need to wait if a device is unplugged or disconnected, I need to wait that entire time out before I move on to communications with additional um, devices on the network. Now, Modbus is a protocol, and a protocol defines a different part or buildup of these binary strings, the different sequence of ones and zeros. So only devices that speak Modbus can understand each other. I cannot connect two different types of protocols directly together because they are different languages. They would have a mismatch of information together. But any device that can speak Modbus and that is set under the correct settings within the system can talk back and forth within this network. Here's a typical example of device A, which would be my Modbus controller. Device B would be any useful Modbus IO device or slave device, as we would refer to it. So this could be my power meter or a BSD. Uh, device A would send a request. Here he says, enable output six and write value 57. Device B would receive that and would respond to confirm he's done the certain action or to give if I say whatever information he requires. So information is sent on digital networks by grouping bits and bytes of binary information together into messages or telegrams that pass between all the stations. These messages have a fixed known notation that the device is now to decode according to the protocol rules. Typically, all protocols, not exclusively Modbus, follow the same sort of format where it would always have a target device address this is important because within like a Modbus network, you could have multiple devices sharing the same infrastructure and the same cabling. So therefore, when a message or request gets sent by a controller, the device needs to know that that message is destined for him. So each of the devices would be assigned a unique address. That's uh, address 1 to 247 in a Modbus network. And if the controller sends a telegram with his specific unique address, he will action that data and read that information and then respond accordingly. And then in our data or content, we'd have whatever useful data or information um, needs to be sent to the device or sent back from the device. And then there's often uh, other useful information in here, such as um, an error checking uh, bits that can check whether any of these ones and zeros have been changed whilst being transmitted between stations, and that can confirm that the data is reliable or it's not reliable. 
So to jump into the Modbus protocol, um, if you had the opportunity to view our industrial Ethernet section on Tuesday, um, I used an OSI model to describe Ethernet networks and the different um, functions of all the different layers of an Ethernet network. Uh, so I'm doing the same here, uh, using an OSI model to describe the communication system um, and to describe the two main categories um, of Modbus is Modbus RTU and Modbus TCP, which all use different layers in the OSI model to communicate. Uh, within Modbus RTU, the two main physical layers or physical mechanisms of connecting devices together would be uh, RS-232 and then RS-485 and 422. Again, RS-232 point to point, you can only connect one controller to one device. And within 485 and 422, you can connect multiple devices on the same cable sharing the same field bus. And then the data link, it's a master slave, so request response type connection. The same Modbus telegram can actually be um, transferred onto Ethernet based networks it's called um, Modbus TCP, where it would use standard Ethernet infrastructure, such as the Ethernet physical layer, the data link layer, um, and then putting the Modbus directly on a TCP frame, which is sitting with an IP frame that handles all our routing and addressing for us, making sure that the message from the controller to the slave device is received to where it is required. And then the Modbus application there, that is the useful data, um, such as what is the function of the message, what is the actual data in the message, um, and handling error codes, and so on and so forth. So jumping back into our system topology, uh, what we're going to start off with is the different available standards. Um, we'll talk about the Modbus RTU standard and the Modbus TCP standard, where RTU is split into 232 and 485. This is not all the standards which have been released um, in, in Modbus directly, but these are the common standards. Uh, I'll cover the three main top ones today. So Modbus RTU, Modbus ASCII, which is also a serial based standard, uh, but is a different way of encoding the messages, and then Modbus TCP IP. You also get um, additional standards such as Modbus over TCP. That's pretty similar to Modbus TCP, the only difference is now you're actually taking a Modbus RTU message and putting it on top of a TCP. Where Modbus TCP varies a little bit is it um, excludes the checksum or the checking bytes at the end of a Modbus telegram within Modbus TCP because the Ethernet, um, Ethernet data link layer already handles uh, checking of uh, any errors and changes in the message. Then you get Modbus over UDP. And uh, Modbus Plus, this is a proprietary protocol uh, by Schneider Electric, uh, a little bit different to the other Modbus uh, protocols under the data link layer, it uses HDLC um, and allows multiple masters on a, a serial network and a bit faster communications. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, proprietary and, and um, not, not, not covered today. So to start off, uh, Modbus RTU, well, serial Modbus for using RS-232 and 45. Uh, RTU stands for Remote Terminal Unit. Uh, the RTU format follows the commands of data with a cyclic redundancy check, this thing over here, checksum. Um, that is an error check mechanism to check the integrity of data. So there's an algorithm that runs to make sure that all the ones and zeros in this entire telegram are received in the same format that they were transmitted out. And this is how a digital system such as Modbus can check whether there has been um, a change in what uh, he expects. Right. Modbus RTU is the most common implementation of Modbus version. Uh, the message must be transmitted continuously without inter-character hesitations. Um, Modbus messages are framed by idle periods. So in between Modbus uh, requests and responses, there's a silence period, uh, which gives a prompt for a device to respond um, to the initial request. With uh, RS-232 in Modbus RTU, uh, you can only have one master and one slave. It's a point-to-point -point type system, but we can also run Modbus RTU over 42 and 45, where you can have one master. It's very important, only a single master uh, can run on those systems, but you can communicate up to 31 slaves on a single segment, but you can have a whole host more if you use uh, repeaters um, to connect into those different systems. So this is the format of a typical Modbus RTU message. You would have an address, 
um, whether in both the request and the response messages, the address uh, gives the destination of where is the request meant to come to, and in the response, where is the message coming from? You would have a function code. A function code gives definition to what is the function of that message. What, what is that message meant to do in a slave device? Am I meant to write data to the slave device? Am I meant to read data from the slave device? The useful data, so I'm 108 degrees Celsius, which slots into those data formats over here. And then it ends off with a checksum, just checking the integrity of this entire message. Very, very simple protocol, and that's why it becomes very popular um, for, for use in, in industry and other applications. Modbus ASCII, uh, similar to Modbus RTU, except it uses ASCII encoding. Um, it's also the checksum's a little bit different. Um, it uses a longer uh, LRC type checksum. And the start and end uh, delimiters of the protocol are not a silence period. The start starts off with a colon or 3A um, hexadecimal and it ends off with a carriage return line feed 0D, 0A. Um, and that's how frames are separated from each other. Um, Modbus ASCII is not as popular as Modbus RTU purely because uh, the uh, frames become substantially longer. It uses double the amount of data to transfer the same amount of information as RTU. Uh, the only benefits of ASCII is that it's a bit easier to re uh, or human readable uh, without decoding. Uh, however, it is uh, a lot less efficient than Modbus RTU, but it would say travel over the network in the same mechanism and uses the same addressing and function mechanisms as RTU. Jumping into TCP, I'll use my uh, OSI model again to describe how TCP works. Um, with Modbus TCP, the lower, the lower layers of the TCP IP, uh, or sorry, Ethernet takes care of the lower layers, so routing uh, the physical messaging um, as such. So Modbus can be implemented at 10 megabits per second or 100 megabits per, cent, uh, per second Ethernet networks. Um, the messages can be transferred over the various physical mediums, including copper, uh, wireless using wireless LAN, or even fiber optics. Uh, within Modbus TCP, we have a dedicated communication port, port number, which is port 502. Uh, so if you're using Modbus TCP, it's, it's pretty important to make sure that that port is not blocked by any firewalls in your switches or infrastructure, because uh, if it blocks that port, we'll not be able to communicate uh, on a Modbus TCP network. Uh, a Modbus TCP frame consists of six main fields. Um, the two byte transaction identifier is followed by a two byte protocol identifier. This is always zero for uh, Modbus TCP. There's a length field indicating the total length of the frame. And then the unit identifier is actually a slave address. Uh, this can and cannot be used. Uh, where this is actually useful is if you want to integrate Modbus TCP into a, a Modbus RTU um, network through using a server or a gateway, it will then take this address and use the addressing mechanism. But for Modbus TCP, we don't use um, addressing directly in the Modbus TCP frame. We use IP addresses to connect to different uh, Modbus components in, um, in the network directly. So a couple of important things to know about uh, the Modbus protocol. The first being is um, we need to understand a bit about memory. So we have a concept called Indian or Indianness, and this is how data is received and consumed and how it's stored in memory in devices and in controllers. The address is the, so we can think of memory as a long array containing a whole lot of bytes or bits. Um, the address is the index within this array that refers to the memory location. Um, an example of data that might be transferred on a network would be a floating point or a 32-bit integer, and this, uh, this would basically follow four bytes uh, to transfer this data. And uh, each of these bytes gets stored in a different memory address or location, just like a post box. So why Indian this is important is there's two different ways which I can store this information. If I have this, this is my floating point or information, this could be my 108 degrees uh, Celsius, for example, being transferred on the network. The two different ways I can store this data is either big end in, which means that I'm storing the big end in uh, first from the lowest address to the last uh, device being at the highest address, 
or I could use little Indian, which runs from the little Indian, that's where it comes from, uh, being stored up until the last byte. Now, it's very important to ensure that the Indian is consistent between all devices in a network. And the reason this can be a problem is if you have a controller and a slave device that are using different um, Indian formats on a network, the data is not going to make sense when it gets read because if you've co uh, misconfigured the Indianness, the data would be read back to front and would, where you're expecting 180 degrees Celsius, you're probably going to see a number that's uh, 30 digits long and doesn't make sense at all. The second thing we need to be made aware of uh, when we're working with Modbus is data types. So there's different types of ways that data can be handled within these digital systems. Uh, anything from uh, one byte um, characters to a 16-bit integer, 32-bit integer, um, or Boolean values, which are, are handled by a different function or to floating points. And why this is important is if I'm reading data, I need to make sure that I consistently read the entire data frame. So for example, if my 108 degrees Celsius is stored as a 32-bit um, integer, I need to make sure that I read all four of those bytes and process all four of those bytes for whatever um, intelligence system I need it for. If I only read the first two bytes of that 32-bit integer, the value is not going to make sense. Um, and would not be able to interpret it. This is especially true for floating point numbers. If you try read a floating point number as a 32-bit integer, it's going to have a very, very high value that would not make sense. So important to familiarize yourself when you integrate a Modbus controller to a Modbus um, slave device or IO device in the field. When you reference the user manual, and the user manuals sometimes are not good at all, uh, and don't give you a lot of information, so sometimes you need to do quite a bit of experimentation, which is very frustrating. Um, make sure that what you configure within your controller or the or the, the client fetching the Modbus data, the data type is correct for what the device is reading. It's restored within Modbus devices is using a series of um, tables or uh, information tables. There's uh, two main tables that we look at. One would be uh, discrete outputs and inputs, and the other would be analog values. Um, these different ta data tables uh, vary depending on the function of what you want to do with uh, do with that uh, information. So, for example, in this first table. <coughs> Um, which is uh, your coils, discrete output uh, coils, uh, outputs being going out of the controller, writing to a value, we'll be using registers number one up to 9,999. Uh, these are data addresses are referenced from a zero reference up to the maximum address would be 9,998. Two discrete outputs, um, you, are, you can read and write within discrete outputs. Um, another challenge which we get with Modbus devices is when it gets implemented into devices, some developers use a zero reference, so they start off the addresses at zero and others start off the address at one. And why this becomes a big challenge is if you're interested in a value, for example, at address five, um, and the documentation says it's at address five, but your controller has a zero reference and the device you're connecting to has a one reference, that means that that value is actually going to be at address four and not address five. So um, keep that in mind that when you are typing in Modbus addresses that you should always probably try um, an address one below or one above if you're not getting the value that you expect at that certain um, memory location. So these numbers can be thought of as location names uh, as they don't actually appear in the uh, actual message. So the zero range, 10,000 range, 30,000 and 40,000 range uh, does not appear in the message at all. Uh, it's more a description of the different memory locations. How we reference these uh, different tables is using a function code, and I'll talk about a function code in the next slide. But the type of information we need to configure is function code telling me which table I need to use, whether it's discrete outputs, uh, analog input registers, or analog output registers. I need to give a data address. So where in this table am I storing that various different types of information. 
So discrete outputs and inputs uh, handle Boolean values. These would be your, I suppose you could call it status tags or start or stop tags. Uh, so these would be single ones, ones or zeros. Uh, whereas my analog input registers and analog output holding registers store larger pieces of information, whether that be 16-bit uh, integers, 32-bit integers, floating points, so on and so forth. Um, I can read that information from these two um, tables over here. Big note, analog input registers are read only, which means that the controller can only read the information stored in the IO device if he's reading from the 30,000 table. Um, and then analog output holding registers, uh, the controller can read information from devices, but it can also write information to those devices. So if I wanted to write, for example, the set point to a um, thermostat sitting somewhere in my field, I could use an analog output register, but if I wanted to read the temperature, I might be using an analog input register. Um, the information which is available within devices would be specified in the Modbus user manual um, directly, and uh, that would tell you what is the tables that certain pieces of information are stored within, and you can reference that based on your function code. So how function codes typically work, we can start off just, this would be a typical uh, Modbus uh, telegram traveling on a network. The first piece of information I need to give would be the slave address. So the request which I'm sending from the controller, where, um, where does that need to go to? And that needs to directly correlate to the physical address that's been set of a device. Uh, the slave address is typically one byte. Uh, we can set Modbus slave addresses anything from one to 247. The addresses actually go from zero to 247, but zero is reserved as a uh, broadcast address. The second piece of information that's uh, programmed within a request or a query would be the function code. Um, the function code can be sort of thought of as an instruction to the slave as to what type of information is being requested by the master, or what type of behavior is being requested. Um, function codes can be used to read a specific type of information from a slave, for example, a measured value, like my 108 degrees Celsius, or it can request a slave to perform a certain action. So I could possibly use um, one of my discrete um, output coils, for example, changing one of these address values to a one instead of a zero to start a certain process or to reset a device, uh, for example. Uh, the function code is defined by a single byte in the request and response frame. The Modbus specification defines a list of available function codes. Similar to the behavior of the address field, the function code is echoed by the slave in the function code of this frame. So the function code table, uh, here's a summary of all the different available function codes and what we can do or uh, cannot do with uh, devices. Um, and a couple of the big ones. So. Function code four would be that you want to read uh, input registers. So in that 30,000 um, 30, range, function code three would be that you want to read or write to, uh, or you want to read holding registers. That's that's your data table in the 40,000 range. Um, if you want to write uh, to these registers, uh, you can write a single register within the holding registers in the 40,000 range. You'd use function code six. And if you want to write to multiple registers and not just a single register, you can use function code uh, 616. And then things like um, reading coils. So these are reading and writing coils would be changing the Boolean values in those first two data tables. So if we jump back here, uh, what we said is that if we're using function code uh, one or two, I would be accessing these tables and doing actions within here. If I'm using function code four, it's a little bit confusing because it's the 30,000 range, but it is function code four. I would be reading values from this table over here. And if I choose function code three, I would be reading or writing. Uh, so I'll be reading values from this table. Function code six, I'll be writing values to this table. So whether you want to read or write, you need to change that function code um, accordingly. And then there's a couple of other useful uh, function codes that, that you can implement to read and write information from these devices as well. So some of the common response or errors, um, a common mistake that system integrators make um, is that they don't actually deal with an error response. It sort of becomes an expectation when you set up a 
a program to read my best information is that you always expect uh, to have a good response. But it's often not a consideration that if it's a bad response, how do I handle that response? Um, and, and what does that information mean? How, how, can, I, how can I use that information um, uh, in the site? So uh, a successful response request, so the uh, controller sends a request to a device and he gets a response back that is a correct reply, has the right number of bytes, and as a valid CRC. So we mentioned that that CRC, that's a little two bytes at the end that checks whether that telegram was received intact. This is successful, this is what we expect, but this is not always the case. Uh, a couple of examples of where this would fail. Um, times out. So as I mentioned, controller sends a request, he doesn't get any response back at all. This could be because a slave device is completely turned off, disconnected, um, or, or damaged in, in some way. This often points to interference, wrong wiring, um, or that there's no slave at that address, so you set the incorrect address. The reason I've highlighted wrong wiring over here, this is a very, very common um, error that you see on Modbus networks. And uh, we'll talk about it more in the, when we talk about the physical layers, but uh, mainly when you're dealing with RS-485, uh, you have your A line and your B line, and you always need to connect A to A, B to B, because that's your positive negative polarities um, for your receiving and transmitting drivers. And if you accidentally cross those wires around connecting A to B and B to A, you're not going to get any response whatsoever. So, um, and what I often find is it's not actually always the system integrator or the user's fault. Uh, very often manufacturers uh, have different interpretations of what is A and what is B. So what uh, manufacturer A might define as his A, which is a negative, Manufacturer B might do the opposite. And so therefore you connect A to A, B to B, but the reality is you're actually mismatching your polarities on those two, so you're not going to get a response at all. Um, and then with an RS-232, RS-232 doesn't have A and B lines, but what it does have is receive and transmit lines. Uh, you need to connect your receive to transmit and transmit to receive. So if you haven't crossed those over, um, you're going to have two transmitting drivers connected to each other and two receiving drivers which means information will never be received in tech, so you're not going to get a response. So when there's a timeout or no response, first thing, check that your wiring is correct. Check that the slave is at the correct address configured within the controller. Um, and if those two uh, check out, then have a look at interference. Do I have some sort of um, noise or interference where there's electrostatic magnetic or something that's uh, damaging my communication signal? The next one, a response is received, but the CRC check fails. So those two bytes at the end, uh, a controller will be able to often indicate to you that the CRC check has failed, or at least we, we hope that they will. Um, and if the CRC check fails, it means that the response was corrupted in some way. Things that can cause corruption could be uh, interference, electrostatic or magnetic interference. Uh, you, it could even be uh, bad wiring, uh, missing terminations. Um, uh, there, there's a whole host of things that could relate to a CRC check failed. And the last one is you get a value time out. There is data on the bus, so you, so you connect in a, an oscilloscope or some sort of bus monitor that helps you to check the data traveling on the network. Um, and you can see that there's data response, but it doesn't really make sense at all. Um, so the data there is garbage. Uh, this indicates a lot of the time that there's interference uh, or noise, um, or even one of your settings um, on one of the slaves has been incorrect. Uh, a lot of the times you can set things like your parity, um, your data bits, your board rate, um, your stop bits, and if one of these are mismatched, then you are going to find that uh, they'll not be able to communicate um, effectively what's, whatsoever. Right. Physical transmission media. So now I understand how the Modbus protocol works uh, using slave addresses, uh, function codes to identify what is the function of that message, what is that message even used for. Um, and uh, what the different data types um, I, I can use in the network. So now I need a way to actually transfer that data from one point to another from the controller. And doing that, I have various different types of transmission medias um, available in my in my arsenal. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, three main transmission medias uh, within Modbus RT of RS232, recommended standard 232, uh, which I'll discuss in a bit of detail. Uh, RS-45 and 422 uh, for multi-slave jobs, 
and then Modbus TCP, which uses Ethernet based um, Ethernet based uh, systems to to connect uh, devices together. So in summary, um, Modbus RS45 uh, is a, a serial line. It's a low cost network uh, using a master slave uh, media access uh, with a transmission speed anything from 1.2 kilobits per second up to 115.2 kilobits per second. The total length of a single segment or a continuous copper cable with slaves connected can be a thousand meters or one kilometer for RS45. If I want to extend past that level, um, I need to use something like a repeat or something that can clean up my signal uh, and transfer it a little bit further. The other limitation I have in RS45 is the um, number of uh, number of stations that can be on a single segment or a continuous piece of uh, copper cable, continuous copper cable, now specify with out repeaters, is a maximum of 32 devices on that segment. Now I need to be careful, it's actually 31 slaves because I have one controller, and it actually would not be 31, it would be 30 because now my repeater is also going to take up uh, one of those uh, stations as well. So if I have 40 devices I need to connect, I have to put a repeater somewhere in the middle to make sure that I can extend that uh, longer distance. Something else to take into consideration is to avoid uh, what we'd call tap links or uh, you might know it as a stub line. Um, and to describe how stub lines work is typically the RS-45 requires a, um, a linear topology, so a daisy chain in between and out of devices. And this is the way I'm actually supposed to be connecting RS-45. However, the standard does allow for a little bit of flexibility and leeway to create a stub line. So if in the middle here, I wanted to daisy chain to connect to another device, I can do that. But I need to be careful with this link over here because this has a certain impedance impact on the segment. And this can cause failed communications if it's installed a little bit too long or I don't handle it correctly. Uh, so what the RS-45 standard uh, requires um, is that for a single one of these links, it can be a maximum of 20 meters long. Uh, however, if I have multiple, um, the sum of all those multiple links cannot exceed uh, 40, 40 meters in the segment. And then what's also required in the RS-45 standard would be a terminating resistor. Uh, the standard actually defines a 120 ohm resistor in series with a one nanofarad uh, capacitor. Uh, and that resistor and capacitor is purely connected in between your A and B lines. Uh, that should be connected at two different points at the beginning and the end of the segment. If I'm using a repeater, that creates a new segment, which means I need two more of these terminating resistors. Uh, and these resistors are becoming a lot more important uh, when you have much longer segments. So if you start running towards that five, 600 meter long RS-45 links with multiple state devices. Um, and what the form of the resistor is, is to take any energy that is generated um, or driven on this uh, copper cable and drain that to zero because it's absorbing um, all that energy at the ends of the signal so that it doesn't bounce back and create reflections. How RS-45 typically works, uh, it's termed a balanced communication system. This is because it uses two wires. One is your uh, data positive and the other is your data negative uh, to transfer the data. However, each of these wires actually sends the exact same signal on them. They reference to each other. They send the exact same signal to each other, but they send inverses uh, of each other's signal. So when a device receives that signal, it actually combines these two signals with B negative A. But since A is your negative line, negative times negative is a positive, it gives you double the amplitude. So the reason that it uses this, uh, what we call a differential signal is actually protected from sources of interference. And the reason is, is if you get something that causes interference, whether it's electrostatic or magnetic interference, whatever interference it injects in the B line, as it's sitting right next to your A line, is probably going to be exactly proportional to or directly um, linked to each other. And what that happens is now because I'm taking my B line minus or B minus A, is I'm actually cancelling these two sources of interference out. And it's super interesting if you take a dual channel oscilloscope connecting it onto a, uh, any type of RS-45 segment, whether it's Modbus, Profibus, um, and you have a look at your um, A and B line signals uh, individually from each other, you'll see 
it paints a very different picture to what you see when you combine uh, the two signals together, uh, where the combined signal looks very neat and clean, but the isolated or separate signals uh, looks a lot more noisy and uh, messy on, on the segment. So RS-45 uh, actually has a way to protect itself from these sources of interference um, and cancel out that noise. That's why when analyzing these systems, it's, it's often very good practice uh, to use a dual channel oscilloscope to have a look at the overall network health. Uh, because you're having the same signal trailing on both your B and A line, if you've created a wiring short, you might not even notice uh, that that segment is particularly unhealthy. Um, so giving you a good overview picture of the health of a segment would be, be done using a high speed uh, dual channel oscilloscope. So jumping into my termination discussion a little bit earlier and the reason for uh, using a 120 ohm resistor um, between my A and B lines is uh, in, this, uh, in this example, you have all your energy traveling down the bus. It finally reaches the end of the segment. It has no more continuity. There's nowhere else to go. So it ends up reflecting or bouncing or echoing back. And that reflection results in um, corruption of future communications uh, that are traveling on the bus and interference with uh, additional communication on the bus. So you, you need a component or resistor that can absorb that energy and prevent it from interfering with future communications. Uh, within uh, RS-45, just use a simple uh, 120 ohm resistor between your A and B lines. Uh, the standard also recommends a, a small, small capacitor, um, but generally you, you easily get away with 120 ohm resistor. Uh, a lot of the times the network components that you're utilizing would have these uh, resistors integrated um, inside them and often be a small little switch that you can flick up. So if you identify um, that one of the nodes at the end of your segment is the last device, you can turn on a switch and it'll um, redirect the signal to this uh, redirect the signal to this uh, 120 ohm resistor to terminate that segment. It's very important that uh, you do not terminate um, in the middle of a segment, as that what that's going to do is actually just absorb uh, the energy that's required uh, to drive drive that bus unnecessarily. Um, another setting you might also see on um, some of your other controllers or slave devices is a uh, RS-45 polarization. Uh, this is one thing that doesn't get a lot of mention uh, as polarization resistors, but they can actually play quite a, a quite a big role in ensuring interference free communication on the network. Um, what's a polarization resistors uh, actually do? So you can see it's powered with a, with a five volt uh, circuit. Um, the detection margin uh, between your B and A signal is usually only about 200 millivolts. Uh, but what I can actually do is I can actually widen this margin by implementing uh, polarizing uh, resistors. Uh, and this widened um, margin significantly um, protects the network from sources of uh, interference. Um, with the signal, uh, this allows for better noise tolerance. Um, this is very important for very long segments, uh, but especially for segments where you've uh, implemented uh, like variable speed drives, frequency converters, very noisy components. Um, where these guys can cause interference. Uh, the resistors uh, which you're connecting in here are known as uh, uh, pull up and pull down resistors um, as they tie the B signal up to a five volt rail and the A signal uh, down to zero volts. So uh, in this scenario here, you can see uh, there's a polarizing um, polarization of this bus. So you've got your, still got your 120 ohm terminating resistor, uh, but then you've got a resistor pulling up um, your, your, your B line to um, five volts, and then putting down your A line to a common uh, grounding, uh, a common zero volts across the entire network, and this just helps to protect the network. So, polar polarization. Not many components have it implemented, uh, but I have seen a couple of um, controllers, as well as IO devices, that again it would be one of the little dip switches uh, next to your termination switch. It would say enable polarization. Uh, so now you understand if if you're experiencing quite a bit of interference uh, on your serial uh, RS-45 Modbus networks, enabling, enabling polarization might just be the fix that you need. Now within the limits of RS-45, we have uh, two main limits. The one is how long my copper segment can be, which is a maximum of a thousand meters, and the number of devices which I can connect in a single copper segment. So. Um, in, this, in this scenario, I have a, a master, a Modbus master, then I have one to 31 slaves. I actually made a mistake here, it's one to 30 slaves because my repeater counts as a component as well. So I can have a maximum of 
32 devices on the side. I go into a repeater, terminating at the end there, and then I can connect another one, two, 31 slaves on the other side of the repeater, making sure to terminate it at the end of the bus. And again, because this is the beginning of my segment, my master needs to have his termination switch enabled as well. Okay. Examples of RS-485 repeaters. Um, this is an example of a, it's a Procon repeater. Uh, simply just uh, takes in one RS-485 segment and repeats it out onto the other segment. It pretty much just boosts the signal, squares out the signal waveform to be nice and even and allows you to expand your network. Um, the reason I actually posted this Profi Hub, uh, this is actually a component designed for Profi bus networks. Um, where Profibus actually also uses RS-485. Um, it changes RS-485 a little bit to work with the Profibus board rates and performance. Uh, but the Profibus, we've tested it in our, our offices a few times. The Profibus works perfectly well with any Modbus RS-485 networks. So if you have an application where you want to um, extend like a nice star topology or something like that, uh, a Profibus will work as a multi-channel repeater uh, to give you that flexibility. Uh, his uh, his error lights are obviously not going to be happy because he's looking for a Profibus signal, not a Modbus signal, uh, but it will work for that application. <clears throat> Our next recommended standard or medium would be RS-232. Uh, RS-232 also used to transmit uh, Modbus ASCII and uh, RTU, uh, but the main differences between RS-232 and uh, RS-45 is that RS-232 is point to point. The maximum length that a RS-232 segment can be is only 15 meters, one five meters uh, from one point to another point. You can have two stations in the entire segment, so a controller and a single I.O. device. Uh, the wires in an RS-232 segment, it has a, receive, a receiving line, a transmitting line, and a ground line, and the receive and transmit are referenced to the ground, so it's very important to connect uh, all three wires in any RS-232 segment. Uh, the data rates which RS-232 can run is anything up to 115.2 kilobits per second. There's no terminations that are required uh, within an RS-232 segment. Um, this is an example of connecting uh, two RS-232 devices together using a D sub 9 uh, connector. Uh, it's one of those nine pin connectors. But the reason I point this out is what is very important is to make sure that you cross over your RS-232 lines. So, the receiving driver of uh, device A and the transmitting driver of device B needs to be connected together and vice versa of the receiving transmitting of the other line. Uh, it's very common this mistake is made that the RX and the TX is not crossed over. For RS-45, it is not the same. RS-45, I connect A to A, B to B, or positive to positive, negative to negative. And my last... Uh, Last uh, recommended standard is RS-422, uh, typical bus length of 120 meters. Um, RS-422, you can have up to 10 stations on it, uh, typically one driver uh, or, or controller and then 10 receiving lines. Uh, RS-422 typically uses four wires, uh, two receiving uh, drivers and two transmitting drivers with uh, varying polarities. And the data rates in a 422 segment can be up to 10 megahertz per second. Um, the main differences, uh, of, so talking about the difference between, you might have heard of RS-45 two-wire and RS-45 four-wire, um, or the same thing as, uh, as that uh, with 422. Um, with four-wire, the master's transmitter can be connected to all the slave receivers um, permanently, and all slave transmitters are connected to the master's receiver. Now, this allows the half-duplex operation and management of the bus to become a lot more simple. Uh, however, with two-wire operation, the master needs to stop driving the bus to allow the slave to talk. Uh, so in this scenario over here, I have a typical two-wire RS-485 where only one device can share the bus at any individual time. So when RS-485 master sends out a request on the bus, for example, to device one, he then needs to disable his um, transmitting drivers, enable his receiving drivers, and that's when device one can respond and vice versa, and he works online in that fashion. This is a, an example of an RS-45 master that's actually a four-wire master uh, where he has his, um, and he's actually integrating directly into two-wire devices. Only his transmitting drivers are connected to all those devices, which means that he can transmit data to these devices. They can not respond, so he would keep his transmitting drivers uh, open. And uh, this would be an example of a four-wire full-duplex connection between 
uh, devices where your transmitting and receiving drivers are permanently connected onto all the different devices. So um, two wire versus four wire just has effect on the duplex of the system. So whether they can talk and listen at the same time, um, but also the complexity when it comes to uh, handling who, um, who has control over the bus at that time. A couple of uh, useful network components, uh, which you can use within a uh, Modbus network. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, I found very common that Modbus is used as a standard of integrating um, field level sensors and devices directly into um, uh, useful IoT or enterprise type applications. Uh, so implementing a solution such as the IDX Nexus can read Modbus uh, data from devices, whether this is a third party sensor such as digital analog inputs or integrating into existing Modbus networks and make that data useful to store it in uh, a database, transfer it to a cloud service so that you can have a, a pretty app on your cell phone, you can start and stop your brewery from home, or even get alerts and alarms when something has gone wrong or gone right since that network. So remote monitoring solutions, you'll find that uh, Modbus is very often um, implemented and, and available on these solutions. Now, some of the typical applications of these would be like water metering, power management, uh, such as solar farms, uh, wind farms uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, refrigeration, uh, checking temperatures of fridges to ensure that um, to ensure that they, they don't vary too too much or remote starting or stopping of pumps uh, and checking levels of dams and, and so on and so forth. Um, and very often it's useful to, well, let's, let's change this. So, in a typical industrial environment, you might have a protocol of choice uh, that could be Profibus, Profinet, any of these uh, large industrial um, fully integrated protocols. But a lot of the times these uh, plants would purchase components that talk um, the, the protocol like Modbus RTU, um, whether it's 485 or 232. An example which I gave on that first um, architecture page, I showed the truck on a, on a, on a way scale. And very often these load cells on the way scale measuring trucks going in and out of the industry uh, talk Modbus, uh, whether it's ASCII or whatever it might be. So a very common application is that that scale needs a way uh, to get information onto your high level control systems, whether that's Profinet or um, anything else. So uh, using something like the Anybus communicators, uh, what a typical Anybus communicator will do is he'll act as a master on the RS-485 or the Modbus uh, RTU side. He'll fetch the data from all those components, pass that data to the high level protocol, whether that is um, Profinet or Profibus, he'll act as a slave to the Profibus or Profinet, allowing us to fetch that information. So we're connecting a serial network uh, to a higher level um, uh, industrial Ethernet or field bus type system. If I want to connect two different networks together, I can use things like X gateways. They can speak both Modbus um, and they can talk about any other protocol. So it's mainly designed to connect a um, Modbus controller or master to uh, a controller on any of these other protocols. And there's a great range of modular gateways uh, from Kunbus that allows you to select whichever protocol you want and integrate them directly into uh, from Modbus to, to any high level protocol as well. Uh, training and next steps. Uh, we do actually offer this course as a, a full Modbus course. It takes an entire day. There's some practical sessions if you want a bit more hands on approach on how do I work with Modbus? How can I use these systems? Uh, give me a bit more details on the timing settings that are very useful and doing some practical fault finding. Uh, we do offer training on alternative technologies. Again, if you haven't uh, seen our last two webinars on industrial Ethernet and Profibus, please do jump uh, onto our, our YouTube channel and, and have a look at these. They, they, were, they were run pretty well. Um, and then, yeah, in your Modbus uh, networks, investing in the in the testing tools, typically for 45 uh, systems are working using a high-speed oscilloscope. It will be useful to identify any faults. Uh, for Modbus TCP or Ethernet-based networks, you could use um, Ethernet-based testing tools like the presenting Atlas and Mercury's uh, provide some pretty useful functions for that. Um, and then have support resources on speed dial. You, uh, IDX does specialize in these uh, protocols and work with them daily. Uh, so if you have any questions, drop us a mail uh, and we're always happy to, to respond.